High blood pressure is as dangerous as an overpumped balloon. Measuring your blood pressure every day can save you from risk of high blood pressure. MicroLife Fully Automatic Upper Arm Blood Pressure Monitor with Stroke Risk Detection. MicroLife AFib screams for atrial fibrillation while taking your blood pressure. High blood pressure and atrial fibrillation are both considered controllable risk factors for stroke. If AFib is present during blood pressure measurement, the AFib icon is displayed flashing at the end of the triple measurement. Once three measurements are complete, the measurement data are shown on the display. MicroLife, a partner for people, for life. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. As we greet you from the studios of the Islamic Broadcasting Network here in my native island of Trinidad, with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Uh, we are still in the month of uh, Jumadi al Akhir. Uh, half of the month is already gone. We had the full moon uh, a few days ago. And so the month of Rajab is around the corner. And uh, allow me, if you don't mind, to remind you once again of the need to, to learn to recite the Quran in Arabic so that when the month of Ramadan comes, you can fulfill the most important sunnah of Ramadan. And that is to recite the whole Quran in Arabic from cover to cover. This is a sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu waslam ordained by Allah himself. Uh, if you make the effort, alhamdulillah, we will keep on supporting you and praying that Allah might bless your efforts that you will learn to recite the Quran in Arabic, inshallah. But if you say, I am not going to learn, I don't want to learn, I'm not going to learn. You're a danger to us. That's right. So we don't want to see your face. We don't want to shake hands with you. Stay away from us. You're a danger to us. Now then, we're going to spend today, as usual, with uh, some announcements, important announcements. Then I want to spend a few minutes again with Venezuela because it's a very... Uh, dangerous situation there and it's continuingly dangerous and then finally we'll turn to answering questions and we have some important questions to answer today so now let's begin with our announcements and the good news is that the two books that I was waiting on the two last new books of mine before I can send start sending you your orders of complete sets of more books the first one has arrived here we are we're going to zoom in on it uh, the Quran, the Great War, and the West. The Quran, the Great War, and the West. It has arrived, alhamdulillah. And uh, uh, tomorrow, I hope to be able to go to the post office and get um, uh, Constantinople in the Quran. I got a notice that there's a package in the post office. I hope it's that possible. So if I get Constantinople in the Quran tomorrow, it's been printed. I've not seen it as yet. <laughs> Uh, then I can start mailing out your parcels 
uh, of complete sets autographed to you uh, during this week, inshallah. If you are uh, still, you still, you still would like to order complete sets autographed from me. Uh, we we have uh, we no longer have any more of the importance of the prohibition of riba in the Quran. I had only 15 copies of the first first 15 sets will get that. But after that, the complete set still remains about 50 we have. And uh, uh, if you would like to get a complete set, uh, do please send me an email if you are abroad. But if you are in Trinidad and you need a complete set, you get, a, you get it at a lower price than from abroad. And uh, for that, you will have to send me an email. My email is at the bottom of the screen, uh, inhussein at hotmail.com. Or you can call me on my, my cell phone, 720-3059. But I'm only giving this telephone number for you who are in Trinidad. <laughs> please, please, please don't call me from all different parts of the world. I prefer email contact, please, not telephone calls. Okay. Um, I did mention uh, last week that I am uh, uh, going to invite all those who are in politics in this country or who are commenting on political issues or who are political scientists, um, political scholars, colleagues of political science, uh, uh, to come to my home so that I can try to make a presentation to you on uh, the Quran and politics. What does the Quran have to say on politics? And you would be surprised if you are a politician, if you would be surprised at the warning that Allah has given to you in the Quran. So Alhamdulillah, that <laughs> meeting, meeting has uh, now been arranged and I have invariably got po positive responses, but it's going to be a private meeting. So I'm not going to be reporting to you on the meeting. I'm just letting you letting you know that we are not sleeping, the scholars of Islam know we are not sleeping. We are reaching out the Quran to our people. So make dua that this meeting might be a successful one. It's the first time, I believe, in the history of Islam in this country that this is um, being arranged. Um, the next announcement is uh, that I'm getting numerous requests from people in the Republic of India, uh, that they want to get my books and they have difficulties in getting the books. Um, so we have volunteers now in India who are prepared to take the effort uh, to, to try to build a team who would be in charge. We put you in charge of the translations to, of my books to, to Urdu. We have several books already translated in Urdu. Uh, to Hindi, uh, to Tamil, and other languages that are spoken uh, by large numbers, millions of people in India. Um, and then after the books have been translated, the books will be published in India and marketed in India at prices that the Indian Muslims in particular uh, can afford. Um, and when we sell the books and we get some profits, those profits will go back into paying uh, for volunteers, uh, paying for translations and so on. So the, uh, the appeal that I'm making today is if you are anywhere in India and you like to join this team that's going to be in charge of getting my books translated to local languages in India, getting my books published in India, and then getting my books marketed in India at prices that the Indians can afford. If you would like to volunteer, wherever you are in India, do please send me an email uh, so I can then get you in touch with our team, okay? You'll find my email address again at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the death anniversary of Malcolm X uh, was, I think, two, three days ago. And uh, on this occasion, we pray that Allah might have mercy on his soul. 
and that Allah might raise him on judgment day and enter him into Jannatul Firdaus. Malcolm X, mashallah, 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 what a Muslim. Now then, let us turn to Venezuela. And uh, there is a hadith of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam. And no human being has spoken more extensively. No human being has spoken uh, uh, as uh, accurately about all the signs of the times when we live in the last age as Nabi Muhammad Islam. Others before him, yes, they did speak. But he is the one who has spoken most comprehensively and his words can be authenticated once they are in harmony with the Quran. We know it's the truth. And amongst the time, the things that he warned us about in the last age, he said there will be great liars. So beware. People who tell monstrous lies, mountains of lies in order to advance their agenda, their political agenda, their economic agenda, and so on. And I am one of the few scholars of Islam, I wish there were more with me, who speak out and say that there are three kinds of lies. Yes. We say that there are normal lies, and then there are great lies, and then there is 9-11. That's right, that's right. So we know who are the great liars of the world. They got PhD in telling lies out there in Washington. And now they're waging war on Venezuela. And I've said to you there are many reasons why they have this obsession with Venezuela. One of the reasons, not the only one, but a very important reason was because they are waging war on all of mankind on behalf of Israel. Their obsession is to ensure that Israel becomes a ruling state in the world. So when they said that all that we're looking for is a home for a people without a home, that the Jews should have a place where they can live, and that's why we want Israel. That was a monstrous lie. They wanted an Israel that will rule the world. That's what they wanted. But they wouldn't tell you that because they are liars. But we are not afraid to tell them to their faces. They're liars. They want Israel to rule the world. And so all of mankind must go down on their knees and submit to them so that mankind would submit to Israel. And that's why they hated Chavez. They hated Hugo Chavez, and we want to remind every single Muslim in this country to whichever politi political party you belong, that's irrelevant. Your heart is with Allah, not with a political party. And when Gaza was being destroyed, mercilessly bombed to pieces, people are being killed, children are being killed. Who stood up? For Gaza, who stood up for Palestine? It was Hugo Chavez. That's right. And they never forgave him for that. He expelled the Israeli ambassador. He broke diplomatic ties with Israel. He condemned Israel as an oppressor. And he stood by the oppressed people of Palestine. Will our political leaders in this country remember that? We, the Muslims, will not forget that. Remember that. We will not forget that that Chavez stood up for the Palestinians, stood up for Gaza when they were being oppressed. And that's why Washington never forgave him. Venezuela must bend its knee before Israel. That's why Venezuela must bend its knee before Washington. That's why they're waging war on Venezuela. If you didn't know that, well, let us remind you. And so, our prophet said that they tell great lies. And hence, uh, we can anticipate. Uh, it is with terror in our hearts 
that we speak these words, that who knows, there might be a, another big false flag act, attack of terrorism on Venezuela and put the blame on the Venezuelan government. Yes, uh, that's their modus operandi. Yes, but on judgment day, they will be put before mankind full of shame and disgrace, laden with sin. That's judgment day for them. These people who tell monstrous lies. But our prophet also spoke of something else in Akhirul Zaman. Not just monstrous lies like false flag acts of terrorism in which 9-11 uh, has pride of place. He also said that there will be plague, epidemics. Uh, that the Arabs, for example, are going to be targeted with epidemics. Well, they use the word plague. That word is no longer used now. Now the word is used, epide epidemic. And he said the Arabs are going to die the way sheep die in a plague. So now we know that one of the weapons that they have on Israel's behalf is biological warfare. And uh, who knows? An epidemic breaking out in Venezuela, people dying like sheep, and the need for humanitarian aid, medical aid, and so on. And they use that as an excuse. We have to intervene on a humanitarian grounds. <laughs> yes, so let us pray that Allah might protect the poor masses in Venezuela, not the rich who have been profiting from all the oil wealth all these years before Chavez come. Not the middle class who have now become poor and they have turned against him, and against, against the government instead of against the Washington, which has caused them to become poor. No, no, we pray on behalf of the poor masses of Venezuela, the millions in Venezuela who are permanently poor, and that's oppression. And we, when Chavez came, then that's for the first time they ever had some economic sunshine. And these people would rather die than return to permanent poverty. And that is the future that comes if Washington succeeds. Millions in Venezuela will have to return to permanent poverty. So we pray, we pray, we pray to Allah to protect Venezuela from any false flag act of terrorism, monstrous, monstrously evil false flag act of terrorism to try to bring down the government. Or, worse still, a biological attack of plague or epidemics to bring about a horrendously evil situation which will demand a humanitarian intervention and humanitarian assistance. We know that many countries are already helping Venezuela. But here in this country, perhaps the Muslim, we have many organizations in this country, mashallah. Muslims and many individuals who have been who have been up at the front in engaging relief efforts for disasters and so on in the Caribbean. And uh, perhaps these words of mine might reach them uh, that these Muslim organizations in Trinidad which specialize in uh, relief effort uh, should come together and approach the Venezuelan ambassador in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, to find out what can we, as a Muslim community in Trinidad, what can we do to help our brothers in Venezuela and to show our appreciation for the courageous stand that they took up in support of the Muslims of Gaza who are being bombed. Barbarians were bombing them and destroying them so many years ago. We pray that Allah may bless such an effort by the Muslim community of Trinidad and Tobago to help our brothers and sisters in Venezuela at this, their moment of greatest distress. Now then, let us turn to the questions and we have enough time today, alhamdulillah, to answer some questions, bismillah. Excuse me. What is the proper response that we should have to all of this information which is now being presented concerning signs of the times which make us so terrified and uh, Dajjal and so on and Gog and Magog. 
what should we do? Well, Moeen, I hope you're listening, Moeen, because they wrote to me about you. You do not leave all your work. You do not leave all the activities that you're connected with work and turn away from it and devote yourself only to worship and to pray. That's not the way, Moeen. You have friends, you have students, you have relatives, and you leave them all to live like a hermit. That's not the way to respond, Moeen. No. Our prophet said, Moeen, I hope you're listening to me, because your family wrote to me. Our prophet said, alayhi salatu was are you listening? He said, even if it's the last day before the end of the world, and you have a plant to plant in the ground, go ahead and plant it. That's right. Go ahead and plant it. So the signs of the times, the events concerning the Jal and Gog and Magog and all these things, must not cause you to give up your work, give up the world, and devote yourself only to prayer and salat and, and give up all your friends and relatives. And not at all. This is not Islam. Yes, you can leave the cities where your babies and your children will be destroyed. They will have no memory. They will be like jasads. You can leave the cities which are filled with sin. You can leave the cities which are dependent on the countryside for food and for water and so on. You can leave the cities where you are sitting duck when nuclear war takes place. You can leave the cities and go to the countryside. What's wrong in living in the countryside? What's wrong in living with a village? Nothing wrong with that. Most British people, most Englishmen, 150, 200, 300 years ago. Most of them live in villages. You hardly had a city in Britain of 5,000 people except for London and so on. Overwhelming among majority of the British people were living in small communities, farming communities. Yeah, they lived a better life at that time than today when you live in mega cities of 10, 20, 30 million people, yes. So this is my answer to you, Moeen, if you've been listening to me. Stop what you're doing. Go back to work because our Prophet has ordered you. Even if you have a tree to plant, go ahead and plant it even if it's the last day. Having answered Moeen, now let's go to another question which I have answered many times in the past. So it will help me if instead of sending this question to me or asking me this question, you do a little bit of homework. Go to my website, check out the questions instead of questioning me. I've answered this question many times already. So it is taking a precious time for me to answer it one more time. Do you understand that? The question is, what is the link between Surah Al-Fatiha and Shifa? People have lots of serious illnesses now. Cancer is a major illness in the world today. Alzheimer's is a major illness. Dementia is a major illness. People increasingly are suffering from mental illnesses around the world today. And, uh, um, and dying. Young people dying, heart attacks and so on. And so people are increasingly asking, what is the spiritual remedy? And when they hear that there's a link between Surah Al-Fatiha and Shifa or healing, they want to know what is that. Even if you're a medical doctor, you still want to know what's that. So they, I'm going to spend a brief time with this answer, otherwise I take too much time. That is that you probably know the story about uh, some companions of the Prophet Islam, and the chief who got bitten by a snake and so on. I'm only giving you the skeleton. And uh, one of the companions, the Muslim, recited Surah Al-Fatiha, blew on the chief 
and he was cured of the snake bite. Otherwise, he would have died. And when they got a hundred sheep as a gift there, um, in return for what they had done, and they brought the sheep, and they asked the prophet, can we keep the sheep? He said, yes, you can keep the sheep. And then he, he, this was the occasion when he said that in Surah Al-Fatiha, there's a cure for every illness. In Surah Al-Fatiha, there is a cure for every illness. Good. That's the hadith. That's the event that took place. Now we take over for our analysis. What is the link then? Is there any link that we can see between Surah Al-Fatiha and Shifa? And the answer is, Islam declares that Allah is a Shafi, the one who heals. And the command center from where he rules the world, he administers the whole world, is the Arsh. The Arsh. Um, and between the Arsh and this world, he has created seven worlds of space and time, or seven samawat. Or, I don't know whether this is a correct term to be used uh, in, in the language of, of uh, astrophysics, uh, seven parallel universes, mm -hmm. seven worlds of space and time, the sabaa samawat. And uh, Surah Al-Fatiha uh, Al is comprised of seven verses. The first verse of Surah Al-Fatiha, without a shadow of a doubt, is the first verse of the Quran. And the Quran begins with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. You cannot, cannot challenge that. Since the Quran begins with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, we begin with the name of Allah, most compassionate, most merciful. The first verse of Surah Al-Fatiha is Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And then follow the other six verses until you reach Amin. And so now, these are seven verses, and these are seven steps on the ladder to the Arsh. So I have suggested, this is my opinion, you do not accept my opinion unless you're convinced that it is correct. You know the rules. So I have suggested that it is, it is not so much the surah that is being recited, but who is reciting the surah. If you have, you have a, 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 someone working for you and you pay them the wage of a slave, you are oppressing them, you can recite surah al fatiha as much as you want. It's not going anywhere, no. If you are uh, a businessman and you're taking money in an overdraft from the bank, you're borrowing money and interest. And if you're borrowing money and interest or lending money and interest because you have a fixed deposit in the bank, uh, Allah's messenger has cursed you. So if Allah's messenger has cursed you and you recite Surah Al-Fatiha, where will it go? Hmm? I can mention many, many other things. But if you are someone with whom Allah is pleased, MashaAllah, then when you recite Surah Al-Fatiha, if you recite it with this consciousness in your heart, that when I recite Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, I'm now in the first Sama. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, I am now in the second Sama. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, I'm now in the third summer. I like this. And you are ascending. And when you reach Amin, I am now in the Arsh. This is psychological. Then when you reach to the Arsh and you ask for dua, for Shifa, if Allah has accepted your Surah Al Fatiha, then the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, this recitation of Surah Al Fatiha can cure any and every illness. So we must be careful of what the heart has inside of it. If the heart is turned sincerely 
to Allah. Not the one who says, Sheikh, I can't say that. If I stand up, you know the mission of a Muslim in the world. If it is right, stand up for it. Regardless of the political party you are supporting. If it is right, stand up for it. Regardless of the price you have to pay. If it is wrong, stand up against it. Amar bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar. This is the mission of the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Not to be camp followers of this one or that one. لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ We are supposed to be a model unto mankind. And this is how you establish yourself as a model, that when it is right, you stand up for it, regardless of the price you have to pay. Don't tell me, if I do that, they're going to put my name on a no-fly list. If I do that, they'll say I'm a terrorist. If I do that, my business might collapse. No, don't bother about that. Live for Allah. The only those who live for Allah will be prepared to die for Allah. And if you are prepared to live for Allah and to die for Allah, you have power that none can destroy. You will live on forever. Even if they kill you, you will still keep on living. Yes. So these are the people who stand up for the truth regardless of the price they have to pay. Stand up against that which is wrong and evil and oppression and wickedness and a mountain of lies. And when you live like that and you recite Surah Al Fatiha, it's a world of a difference from that one who recites Surah Al Fatiha, but he's a coward. He will not stand up for what is right and stand up against what is wrong because his business will be affected. When you have that kind of profile, when the heart is turned towards Allah sincerely, and remember what Allah says in the Quran, it is in Surah Al-Anfal. Listen to what he says. Ba'adawudhi billahi min shaitanir rajim when my teacher used to teach, and I am in the classroom, any time he quoted from the Quran, I would record it. I had a big book. And when I go back to my room, I go search, find that verse, and study it. That's how I studied with my teacher. So when I quote for the Quran, please take a pen and paper, write it down. This is in Surah Al-Anfal. And Allah says, وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَحُولُ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَقَلْبِهِ Be conscious of the fact that Allah hovers between a man and his heart. That Allah hovers between a man and his heart. That's how close he is to the heart. He's watching the heart. He's watching the heart to see whether the heart is sincere to him or oh, your primary loyalty is to a political party rather than to Allah, then that heart is gone. And so there you are. This is my answer to you. Seven verses in Surah Al-Fatiha and seven steps to the earth, meaning the seven Samawat. And if you have this psychological belief that every time I recite one of the ayat of Surah Al-Fatiha, I'm climbing one step on the ladder, then when you reach to the arsh and you say Amin and you make the dua, may Allah accept your dua and give you shifa. Now then, next question. Bismillah. In, uh, in my last session, I responded to the crucifixion and I uh, shared with you a verse uh, sorry, is, yes, a verse of the Quran in which surah? Surah to Ali Imran. Maulana uh, Siddiq Ahmad Nasir, he got a computer in his head. So he quotes the name of the surah and the number of the ayah. I don't have that computer in my head. So I, I will simply tell you which surah it is. You do your homework and find the verse. And in that verse, Allah is speaking to Nabi Isa, speaking to Jesus, 
at the moment when they are about to try to crucify him. Jesus doesn't know what's going to happen. So Allah is saying to him, this is what's going to happen. And we know they did not kill him, number one. We know they did not crucify him, number two. We know that Allah made it appear like that, number three. And then Allah says, oh Jesus, I'm going to take your soul and I'm going to raise you unto myself. And I'm going to cleanse you of what they have said about you, the kuffar, the ones who rejected you and those who are in alliance with them. And then he says something more. وَجَاعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ وَجَاعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ فَوْكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ ثُمَّ إِلَيَّ مَرْجِئُكُمْ فَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ فِيهِ تَخْتَلِفُونَ Oh Jesus, I'm going to cause those who follow you. Do we follow him? Wake up. Think. No, we follow Nabi Muhammad. Alayhi salatu was. Allah says in the Quran, He says, In kuntum tuhibbun Allah, if you love Allah, فَاتَّبِعُونِ Then follow me, Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam. يُحْبِبْكُمُ Allah, Allah will love you. So we are an ummah and we follow this Nabi. Yes, we believe in that Nabi and that Nabi and that Nabi, yes. But we don't follow them. We don't belong to their ummah. We belong to this ummah. We follow this Prophet. In the grave, we're going to be asked, which is the prophet you follow? And our answer in the grave will be this prophet, Muhammad So Allah is saying, those who follow Jesus, not those who follow Muhammad, those who follow Jesus, وَجَعِلُوا الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ And I am going to raise those who follow you. I'm going to raise them above and dim, dim, dominant over those who have rejected you, who are the Jews, that's the, and the, those who support the Jews, the Christians who support the Jews, that's the Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance, which has NATO as its military arm, which gave to the world Britain as a ruling state and gave to the world the United States of America as a ruling state. Allah says, I'm going to raise those who follow you above them, above NATO. And when I do that, you will remain in that, they will remain in that position of dominance and superiority over them. Until the end of the world. And you tell us that we Muslims want to rule the world? What nonsense. That's not the Quran. The Quran does not say that this Ummah wants to rule the world. No. The Quran says that those who follow Nabi Isa, Islam, Jesus, will be raised above and dominant over those who are opposing him, which is today the, the Jewish Christian Zionist Alliance. And when these are raised to that position of dominance, they'll remain like that until the end of the world. Don't blame me. If you never knew this before, and if this new knowledge creates problems for you, that's not my problem, that's yours. My duty is to reach the Quran out to you. So now the question is, who are these Christians? Who are these people who follow Jesus? And my answer is not you who will decide. No. And your Maulana will not decide. No. And your Jamaat will not decide. You will not decide who are those who are following Jesus and who will be raised into that position of dominance. It is Allah who will decide, not you. He will decide, not you. 
Shall I shout it again? So don't come with all your, your rigmarole questions, arguments and this and that and the other. It is Allah who will decide. And my perspective is Allah has already shown us. Because today, Russia leads the Orthodox Christian world where a man can never marry another man and get a marriage certificate. And in a brief space of time since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the godless Soviet Union, and the chaos which followed the collapse of the Soviet Union, in this brief span of time, maybe just 20 years, Allah has caused Russia to rise so quickly and so unexpectedly. Today, Russia is the dominant military power in the world. And Russia has said to the United States, we can destroy the United, the United States of America. In half an hour, we can destroy the United States. I have therefore, I, I have identified the people whom Allah is raising to that position of dominance, and I can see it before my eyes, but you cannot see it. You who have this hatred for the Russian people, and you who are supporting the Ottoman people until you enter into Jahannam with that foolishness of yours. The Ottoman Empire, which for 600 years waged bogus jihad on the Orthodox Christian. But you can't see that, and you're only criticizing me. Well, then, why don't you read my book, Constantinople, in the Quran? Yes, if you have the stomach for truth. When you read my book, Constantinople, in the Quran, then you will see where Allah is self helping them, the Orthodox Christian world. And that's why I devote so much time to Belgrade and to Moscow and to the Orthodox Christian world. And I hope and pray that the Muslims in Bosnia, the Muslims in Serbia, the Muslims in Macedonia, the Muslims in Albania, the Muslims in Kosovo, I know you love me there. Yes, I know that. But you cannot understand because you have 600 years of brainwashing behind you. That these are the people whom Allah has chosen as, as, as recognized as following Jesus. And they are being raised now before our very eyes. Before Allah changed the Qibla, we followed the Qibla in Jerusalem. That's right. That was our Qibla. And then Allah changed the Qibla, sorry, no, Allah gave us a new Qibla. But their Qibla still remained valid for them. Did you know that? Would you kindly read my book, Methodology for Study of the Quran? Yes, read that book, please, and you will see. Where in the Quran, Allah says that's still their Qibla. They must follow their Qibla and you must follow your Qibla. You must not follow their Qibla. They must not follow your Qibla. You want to bring a new, new religion in the world? There's only one valid Qibla in the world? Is that, that's a new religion. That's not Islam. No. They still have their Qibla. That's right. And we still, we have our Qibla. And it is the people whom Allah will choose. He will recognize them as the people following Jesus. And he will raise them. Whether you recognize them or not as the followers of Jesus is irrelevant. I'm sorry to have to shout like this. But some people still can't understand. They can't think. It is not you who will decide who is following Jesus. Not you, not you, not you. Allah will decide. If you are, de if you are in deferring, you are deferring, you disagree with Allah, take your, take your problem with Allah. No, not with me. Tell him, I defer with you. <laughs> ah, yes, what do you, can we do now with such people? This, these are the Christians, the Orthodox Christian world, whether you like it or whether you don't. It is the Orthodox Christian world which was in Constantinople. That Constantinople, which remained faithful to the Sabbath. They didn't go fishing on the Sabbath. And this Christian world went fishing on the Sabbath day. And Allah cursed them, Kunu kiradatan khasain, be apes despised. So you see them like apes, publicly naked. And you see them like apes with a preference for bedroom life in public. That's 
the Orthodox. That's the, the Western Christian world today. And if you're living in the West and you can see this, it's time for you to get out of it. Get out of it. Now then, next question. Will there be total peace in the world after Dajjal is destroyed? There will be a period of peace and justice in the world. That's right. When Nabi Isa alayhi salam will establish the ruling state, the Khilafah state, they call it the holy state of Israel. We call it the Khilafah state. Um, a successor state to the holy Israel of Suleiman alayhi salam. A successor state. And uh, we will have a, a, a Khilafah state in uh, Makkah, and, Nabi, and Imam, Imam al Mahdi will rule over us. And there will be justice in the world, yes, there will be justice in the world. Um, when Nabi Isa, when, when Imam al Mahdi dies, uh, Nabi Isa, Islam, Jesus will still live. Uh, then after he dies, what happens after that is that the world will again return to, uh, there will be no believers in the world. Allah will take away whoever has even a grain of a mustard seed of faith in the heart, you'll be taken away from the world. And so only those will be left on the face of the earth who have nothing, nothing no faith in their heart at all. So if at that time you see the Maulana <laughs> with his hat and his beard and his very nicely dressed and so on, and he's quoting the verses of the Quran and so on, at that time you will know he doesn't even have a grain of a mustard seed of faith in his heart. That's the world at that time. Next question. What evidence do you have that the Khilafah state will return. How will the Khalifa be selected? And who will select this, the so-called Khalifa? Which is the question. The uh, Quran in uh, Surah to Noor, uh, which is uh, an ayah that I have to spend more time uh, explaining. Wa'adallahu alladheena amanu minkum wa amilu salihati. لَيَسْتَخْلِقَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ إِلَىٰ آيَةِ إِلَىٰ آخِرِ الْآيَةِ That Allah has made this promise that He is going to bring back the Khilafah state. Oh yes, that is there in Surah An-Nur. The Khilafah state will return for us with Imam al-Mahdi. Our Prophet has given this prophecy. But the Khilafah state will return for, the, for our Christian brothers and sisters when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns and he is their Khalifa. Okay? Uh, we don't have to choose the Khalifa because Allah has chosen him. He's the Imam al Mahdi. They don't have to choose the Khalifa because Allah is sending back the Nabi, the Prophet. Bismillah. Although you did not touch, this is the, the seminar that on the Jala that I had in Birmingham on December 16th. We're going to repeat that seminar on the Jala here in Trinidad. I hope to be able to make the announcement soon. I believe it's going to be December the 28th. And it'll be an all-day seminar Saturday. So if you're flying in from, I, you shouldn't come from Britain. If you're coming from the United States and Canada, then you have the next day Sunday to fly back home. Uh, take a note of that. I'll confirm it soon, uh, December the 28th, and all this seminar on Dajjal here in Trinidad. Although you did not touch on the hadith of Tamim Dari, the question is why did Dajjal speak of all those signs when his primary identity is that of a liar? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conveys information through visions. So this was a vision granted to Tamim Muddari. 
a true vision comes from Allah. Our Prophet said that Nabuwa or prophethood is comprised of 46 different parts. When I am gone, he said, nothing will remain of prophethood other than ru'ya sadiqa and ru'ya saliha. Ru'ya is primarily a vision but could also be a dream, a vision conveyed in a dream. Uh, visions which are true and visions which are um, sa saliha, good, virtuous. And these visions have been coming constantly to the world. Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam is granted a vision and he sees someone sitting on his throne and he's so terrified by what he sees because he recognized that fellow that he wants to inherit my kingdom and he is terribly, terribly, terribly evil. It was a vision. And Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam immediately made the dua that no one should be able to inherit my kingdom after me so that holy Israel will collapse when I die. And that's exactly what happened. That was the vision. Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam has a vision in which he sees himself sacrificing his son. But when he attempts to sacrifice his son, Allah says, no, 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 I never ask you to sacrifice your son. Human sacrifice is not a part of this deen. No, you have accepted the sacrifice in your heart. That's what I wanted. The sacrifice of the son is something which will take place in Akhiru Zaman. Which son it is? The Quran does not tell us. The Quran is silent on the subject. And when Allah is silent, I am not going to open my mouth. No, when Allah is silent. Nabi Muhammad Islam, he identified the son as Ismail Islam, but the Quran is silent. So in Akhiru Zaman, the, the seed of that son is going to be sacrificed. Yes. So now look in the world and see which one. Is it the seed of his heart which is being sacrificed? Alayhi salam, or the seed of Ismail Islam. The Arabs are being sacrificed, of course. It's the arrows who are being sacrificed. And so what Tamim Udari experienced was a vision. And it is Allah who conveyed that vision to him. Dajjal had nothing to do with it. Allah gave it to him. Question. Is there an alliance or a collaboration between Dajjal and Shaitan? Bismillah. The place where you have to go to answer this question is, of course, first of all, the Qur'an. Always, always, always go to the Qur'an first. Do not disrespect the Qur'an by ignoring the Qur'an and going to the Hadith first. That's disrespect. Go to the Qur'an first. If you don't have the capacity to do it, go to those who have the capacity. And when you go to the Qur'an, you see that when he saw that fellow sitting on his throne and he made this dua that no one should inherit my kingdom after me, he recognized that that fellow wanted to inherit his kingdom. And Allah speaks of that fellow as a jasad. I have just completed a book, a new book. <laughs> it's now being prepared for the printing of the book. It's about 140-something pages long. When I started the book, I said, I'm going to finish this book in 25 pages. And then I said, okay, maybe 40 pages. And now it's 140-something pages, yeah. That's always like that. What can I do? The name of the book is the Quran, Dajjal, and the Jasad. And it is devoted to that vision that Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam had. Where is this? This is your homework. Go and check it out. Surah to Sabah. Surah to Sabah. And in that vision, he saw this jasad sitting on his throne. And we identified, this is our interpretation, that that jasad is Dajjal. Yes. Uh, you do not have to accept my view unless you are convinced that it is correct. But... Um, when Suleiman died, 
عليه السلام uh, which surah is this now oh sorry sorry I made a mistake the the jasad is in surah to sad surah to sad and now when Suleiman died this one is surah to saba when Suleiman alayhi salam died the jinn who were obliged to work for him who were shayateen mm. did not know that he was dead and they kept on working for him until the minsa'a of his staff. Ah, yes. The minsa'a of his staff collapsed. And when the minsa'a of his staff collapsed, then they realized this is not Suleiman. All the commentators of the Quran, but very few, if there are any exceptions, all declare the minsa is the staff. So they all say that he died while sitting perhaps on his throne and he was holding on to his staff and the dead body remained on the throne for all this time, holding on to the staff until Dabatul Ar came and started to consume the staff and they said Dabatul Ar is like termites. And when the staff collapsed and the body collapsed and then they realized that this was not Suleiman, Suleiman is dead. Well, my response to that kind of explanation is click, crack, the wire bend and that's the way the story ends. That's nonsense for me. No. When Suleiman al-Islam died, the reason why they did not know he was dead was because they saw someone sitting on the throne holding on to the staff. That's why. Right. That was Dajjal. And since they did not know he was not Suleiman, they kept on working for him. That is the relationship between Dajjal and the Shayateen. And up to this moment, as I'm speaking, they're still working for him. Until Dabatul Ard will come to destroy the Minsa of the staff. The Minsa is not the staff. The Minsa is something connected with the staff. Yes. And that is which is connected with the staff, allows the staff to bring moving images of Suleiman before the jinn. So they're seeing him walking and talking. They think be, every television set does that now. Yes. And when the Minsa is consumed, and I believe that's the electromagnetic waves coming today from our cell phones and these things, when it destroys the, magnet, the, the internal miraculous heart of the staff, then that will collapse. And then the staff will no longer be able to present these living images and moving images. Then the jinn will realize this is not Suleiman. Then they stop working for him. So Allah says, وَشَيَاتِينَ كُلَّ بَنَّاءٍ وَغَوَّاسٍ وَآخَرِينَ مُكَرَّنِينَ فِي الْأَصْفَالِ uh, This is Surah Al-Sabah. So here is the link from the Quran. From the Quran. I didn't go to the Hadith. Between the Jal and the Shayateen and the Jinn. Uh, this is enough for, for today. Um, we will continue with questions, inshallah, uh, next week. Um, I hope next week to be able to show you the last book, which is Constantinople in the Quran. I hope to get it tomorrow. And uh, I'm going to start sending, on, sending you your complete sets of books, autographed to you. Um, we already we still have some sets remaining. I told you I have about 50. So if you'd like to order a complete set, send me your mailing name and mailing address. Send me your telephone contact number and send me the name that you want me to write into the book. I'll put all of this on one book, one book, and then for the, all the rest of the books, I'll simply sign them put the, the place and put the date. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.